Hi, welcome back to Focal Point AAFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you in the conversation. I want to begin by a, a soundbite from Franklin Graham, and it touches on the topic that we were addressing in the opening segment. Uh, what do you do if your presentation of the truth arouses hostility? It, it, it makes people angry with you, and they come against you. They try to poison the minds of people in your culture, and that's what's going on around us right now. People they, they like the Southern Poverty Law Center, they are trying to poison the minds of the American people, including the United States military, against the American Family Association for one simple reason. We oppose the normalization of homosexuality. That's why they have tagged us as a hate group. What is that? That's an effort to poison the minds of the American people, including our military, including the media, against the American Family Association, against the family Research Council, and our offense in their mind is we are simply declaring the truth about human sexuality and the truth about marriage, and that divides people. And so you have a lot of people in the Christian community, they've gone into retreat on this issue. They've been so beaten up, so demonized, so vilified that they've given up. They've just gone into the shadows. They've gone into the tall grass a number of the pro-family organizations that used to stand openly and unapologetically with us on this issue, they've gone silent. They've gone quiet. Uh, they're, they're going the kinder, gentler, softer direction so they don't uh, offend anybody. So their voices now have, have gone silent. And the number of organizations uh, like AFA and FRC that are willing to stand boldly in the gap on this issue, shrinking virtually by the year. Uh, and here's Franklin Graham. This is the son of Billy Graham, of course, at Samaritan's Purse. He's on Meet the Press, and he was asked this very question about the controversial things that he said regarding homosexuality. Let's listen. Graham's call to serve the less fortunate is something he shares with Pope Francis, and he applauds the new pope, but to a point. He was asked about uh, gays in the church, and he said, who am I to judge? there ever be a shift for you in that issue? Well, uh, God would have to shift. Um, and God doesn't. God's, uh, God's word is the same to, uh, yesterday, today, uh, a million years from now. And uh, this is sin. But to wink at sin and, and to tell somebody it's okay, when I know the consequences of what will happen one day when they have to stand before God. So I want to warn people, and I think the Pope is right when he says he's not the judge. He's not the judge. God is the judge. I think it's a very profound thing that Franklin Graham said, and he's made it very clear. He's not going to back down. He agrees with the Pope when the Pope said, who am I to judge? And Franklin Graham says, that's exactly right. The Pope is not the judge. And I'm not the judge. And you're not the judge. God is the judge. That is the issue. The issue really is between human nature. The issue is between human beings and an almighty and holy and righteous God. That's where the issue is. It's not between us and those that advocate that lifestyle. It's between them and God, because we're not the judge. We have no moral authority to judge anyone. We are simply the messengers of God's standard of judgment, and the Bible is very, very clear. God is the judge. He's the judge of the living and the dead. He is the judge of all the earth, and we want people to escape that judgment. We do not want them to become subject to, to the wrath of God. So if we know those things, those behaviors, those lifestyle choices that are going to place people in jeopardy of experiencing God's eternal wrath, as Franklin Graham says, we want to warn them because we hate them, because we're homophobes, because we are bigots, because we are intolerant. Absolutely not. It's exactly the other way around. It's because we love people. It's because we care for people. It's because we want people to know the joy and the pleasure of eternal life. And if the bridge is out ahead of them on the road that they're on, across a ravine, they keep going down that road, they're going to drive off into the darkness and into the abyss. We're going to be out there waving our arms and, and saying, look, the bridge is out. That's a road that's going to lead to destruction. Don't go down that path. Now, if people are going to choose to do it, there's not a single solitary thing that we can do about that. Our responsibility simply as Franklin Graham said is to warn people uh, about this. Now, uh, while we're on the topic of 
homosexuality. Just I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about some late developments on this issue. The American College of Pediatricians, these are Americans and they're pediatricians, these are MDs, have come out with a new paper. It actually came out back in March and uh, came across it again this last week in research for this program where they raise questions about parenting. Now, pediatricians, remember, homosexual parenting. Remember now, pediatricians are the ones who see children and their parents day in and day out. They're helping these parents raise their children. So they see, parent, they see children 8, 10 hours a day. So these are pediatricians who are medical doctors. They're skilled at diagnosis. They're skilled at observation. And they see these children in their circumstances. And this paper from the American College of Pediatricians now says that children need a mother and a father. So you're not just taking my word for it. You're not just taking the word of the AFA or the word of the Family Research Council. This is coming from the American College of Pediatricians. And that's our factoid for the day. The American College of Pediatricians, learn it, live it, love it. The American College of Pediatricians say that, quote, children need a mother and a father. And they get into some of the details. There are significant innate differences between male and female that are mediated by genes and hormones and go well beyond basic anatomy. These biochemical differences are evident in the development of male and female brain anatomy. We saw that story a month or so ago about how the brains of men work differently than the brains of females. It has to do with signals going from the front to the back of the brain or crossing the hemispheres. The brain signals in a woman cross the hemisphere, so they're able to do a little better job, uh, job at multitasking. And they're more intuitive. Whereas us guys, I mean, the, the signals run from the back of the brain to the front. So we are focused. We are dialed in. We can tune out uh, distractions, but we're not quite as intuitive as our female counterparts. There's a, there's a need for both. It's not that one is superior to the other. It's not that the male brain is superior to the female brain or the female brain is superior to the male brain. It's that they both have an indispensable contribution to make to relationships, to families, and to uh, society. So these guys are talking about that. There are biochemical differences even in the development of the male and female brain anatomy, psyche, and even learning styles. And we've talked about that before. The way our schools are set up is they're designed for the way the girls learn. Sit in a row and be quiet. Sit still and learn. Cross, fold your hands and learn. This is not how guys learn. They're active. They're energetic. They're males uh, bursting with male energy in every cell of their little six-year-old body. So they need time to run it off. They need. I'm not saying they don't sit in class and learn. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying they've got an energy level that builds up, and it's got to be discharged. you got to give them recess. you got to give them gym class so that that energy has, a, has an outlet so it can be burned off. So hey, there's differences in the way that boys and girls learn. Consequently, mothers and fathers parent differently and make unique contributions to the overall development of the child. Now, you know this, and I know this. The important thing is the American College of Pediatricians is confirming common sense and confirming the Scriptures. Remember, I've often said that things are not true because they're in the Bible. They are in the Bible because they are true. And if they are true, they not only will be in the Bible, but we will find confirmation from other sources that they are truth and that they are true. And that's what we're talking about. Girls without fathers perform more poorly in school, are more likely to be sexually active and become pregnant as teenagers. Boys without fathers have higher rates of delinquency, violence, and aggression. Gender-linked differences in child-rearing styles between parents are complementary and protective for children. That's why it's a harm to a child to be raised exclusively by a mother or by a father. Now, it's inevitable. It, it happens. We live in a fallen world, so that's going to happen. The point is that's not ideal. And, and people that are in those circumstances, I mean, you talk to a single parent and you ask them, is this the ideal environment for your child? And they'll tell you no. They'll say, I wish to God I had a mate to help me in this process. So they will acknowledge that it's a tremendous challenge. doesn't mean it cannot be done. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that kids that grow up in single-parent families are incapable of growing to be mature, responsible. That's not saying that at all. But I'm saying there are challenges there uh, that uh, children are not designed to deal with. 
Um, let's see. Gender link differences in child rearing styles between parents are complementary and protective for children. Eric Erickson was among the first to note that mother love and father love are qualitatively different. Mothers are nurturing, expressive, and more unconditional in their love for their children. Father love, by contrast, often comes with certain expectations of achievement. Uh, you know, and I saw this when our kids were young and we'd go to this playground over at the junior high school where my kids wound up going when they were young, and they had like a playground equipment, the jungle gym, you know, the thing with the, 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 the rungs and you, you go across while you're hanging there in the air and all that kind of stuff, whatever the thing is called, a jungle gym or whatever. What's that called? The uh, ringers? Well, it, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like a ladder, only it's level to the ground and it's elevated five or six feet off the ground. That's like a jungle gym, isn't it? Or I don't know. Anyway, it's the thing where you go hand over hand and you go from one side to the other. You, you climb up the ladder, then you go hand over hand, swing across. And, you know, when my kids would do it, when they were young, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost humorous because Debbie would say the same thing to them every time as the mother and I, as the father, would say the same thing to them every time. What is the last word that Debbie told them when they went to the jungle gym? Be careful. What was the last thing that their dad said to them when they went to the jungle gym? You can do it, and I'll be there to help. Now, that's the difference between mothers and fathers. They're nurturing, protective guys are urging their children to fulfill their complete potential. Uh, gender differences are also reflected in the way fathers and mothers use touch with their children. Mothers frequently soothe, calm, and comfort with touch. Fathers are more likely to use touch to stimulate or excite their children during play. As fathers engage in rough and tumble play, they take on a teaching role like that of a coach. Rough housing between fathers and sons is associated with the development of greater self-control in adolescent boys. I can remember wrestling with my son. I can remember playing football with him in the house, and he's using his strength to kind of move me and budge me and tackle me and block me, and it was amazing the number of times my little four-year-old son could tackle his father and get him on his back. I get Jana out on the trampoline, and we had his game to the moon. I try to bounce them as high as they possibly could. That's what fathers do. Mothers more nurturing and tender. Focal point, AFR Talk.